Welcome to The Cut Comparison, where we compare and contrast different versions of our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we'll be looking at Rob Zombie's 2007 remake of Halloween, which has a theatrical version and a director's cut. As I mentioned in the kill count for the theatrical version, unless you saw this movie in theaters when it was released, you're probably more familiar with the director's cut. That's because writer-director Rob Zombie kinda pulled the George Lucas for the home video releases, and made the theatrical cut all but completely unavailable. I actually had to hunt down a Canadian Blu-ray for the theatrical version, since the box that I've been working from only has the director's cut. The differences between the two cuts aren't crazy drastic, like this isn't a Curse of Michael Myers situation where the entire ending got changed. Rather, Rob Zombie's director's cut just adds a lot more dialogue and extraneous scenes back into the movie, inflating the runtime to over two hours long, which you probably know by now I'm not a big fan of if it isn't necessary. And this shit isn't necessary. Take a look at this change for instance. As an editor, I'm appalled and confused by Zombie's decision to add back in a pointless shot of Loomis walking around the car. But why do that? What does that shot do other than make your movie longer? Some of you may think that a director's cut automatically means more nudity and gore, but for Halloween, that's only half true. You may be surprised to learn that the kills are all exactly the same between both versions. No gore was cut out for the theatrical version, nor added back in for the director's cut. However, there is a bit more nudity in the director's cut, and unfortunately, it accompanies what's probably the biggest difference between the two versions, the scene surrounding Michael's escape from the sanitarium. We'll get to that in a bit, but for now, let's rewind to the beginning of both versions and get to the cuts. The first change you'll notice from the theatrical cut is that the director's cut adds in just a bit more Rob Zombie-esque dialogue when Judith and Deborah Myers are having a family discussion about the importance of a balanced breakfast. Can't you see I'm making eggs over here? Uh, yes. Uh, since when? They're chicken abortions and they're fucking gross. They are not chicken abortions. You know what an abortion is. Charming. After that heartwarming family breakfast, there are some needless shots added in of Michael walking up to and around the school prior to his rumble in the restroom with Junie Cortez. And at the conclusion of that fight, the principal, played by the late Richard Lynch, responds more aggressively to Michael's little sass back. I said, fuck you. Fuck me. Come here. Grab it! After that, there are a couple of minor changes that don't really affect the flow of the movie too much. Stuff like an extra shot of Loomis in the hallway, and after the first batch of murders, a reporter outside of Smith's Grove kicking off a news report that begins without that sound up in the theatrical version. Inside Smith's Grove, we get to one of the more significant changes in the director's cut. The inclusion of these black and white assessment videos that Loomis makes about Michael Myers. One must remember not to be fooled by his calm unassuming facade. The stuff Loomis says in these black and white film segments isn't anything we couldn't figure out on our own. He talks about Michael's calm exterior, his growing fondness of masks, his increasing reluctance to speak to anyone. Again, nothing we didn't already know about the character. I think Rob Zombie just likes these segments because they're sort of reminiscent of the black and white silent horror films he loves, which he would occasionally mimic in music videos like with Living Dead Girl, which of course starred his then-girlfriend Sherry Moon, who would marry him and play Deborah Myers in these movies. Who is this irresistible? creature who has an insatiable love for the dead. That's, uh, that's your future wife there, Rob. I don't hate these deleted scenes, but I do find them entirely unnecessary. Except for the line wherein Loomis mentions Michael's nickname. The child christened Michael Myers has become a, a sort of ghost, a mere shape of a human being. One positive change with the director's cut is that some of the additional scenes make Loomis a more sympathetic character. In one added scene, for instance, Loomis gets permission for Michael to sit outside with him as he begs him to open up more. I'm here to help you. I feel an utter failure at the moment that I, I just can't get through to you. He tells Michael that if he keeps refusing to make progress, the hospital will remove Loomis from Michael's care, showing that in this version, the doctor is legitimately concerned about this potentiality. It doesn't just happen all of a sudden here, like it does in the theatrical cut. And when Loomis is finally taken off the case, he seems much more regretful in the director's cut. As he leaves, he pats Michael on the shoulder and tells him to take care. Take care, Michael. Take care. And while walking away from the sanitarium, he even looks back with regret at the patient he failed to properly help. Contrast that with the theatrical version, where after Loomis tells Michael he's no longer going to be his doctor, the scene immediately fades into his book tour, making it almost seem like Loomis was eager to get out of the hospital and away from Michael so he could sell his story and make some riches. Oh yeah, there's one quick change in between that Loomis stuff that happens after Nurse Wynn comments on a picture of Baby Boo. Cute baby. The director's cut adds a line for the nurse that makes her seem antagonistic towards Michael. 
Couldn't be related to you. Personally, I don't like the inclusion of it. I'd rather have him kill her randomly, like the psychopath he is, than out of anger because of a snide comment she made. Now we're coming up on the most significant change in the director's cut, and it involves the guard named Noel, who's only in a single scene in the theatrical version. His added significance in the director's cut begins in that scene, where he gets a couple extra lines, both of which further establish him as a shitty guy. First, a racially charged line towards Danny Trejo, and then an antagonistic display of machoism towards Michael. Don't look at me. I'll be a shitstorm in your worst nightmare, motherfucker. I'll come in here and fuck this place up one night. You watch. The problem comes when he fulfills that promise, though. It's in the scene that shows Michael escaping from the hospital. And if you'll recall, the theatrical cut has something pretty straightforward. We see a bunch of guards sitting around, waiting to transport Michael to another facility. And then when they do, everything goes tits up because Michael breaks out of his chains and summarily kills the lot of them in a pretty decent escape sequence. There's good violence, some good kills. It's a perfectly adequate escape sequence, right? But for some for some reason, in the director's cut, Rob Zombie decided to have Michael escape not by sheer force, but rather through the idiocy of Noel and his cousin Kendall, a character who's missing from the theatrical version entirely. I'm gonna go ahead and give a content warning, because the director's cut escape scene is particularly nasty and mean-spirited, even just compared to the rest of this Hellbilly Halloween saga. I'll be conservative in what I show, but just a heads up, this shit's not pleasant. That's because Noel and Kendall are two grade A pieces of shit who are here late at night to abuse a new female inmate. They sexually abuse her physically and and verbally in the hallway for a while before getting the idea to go rape her inside of Michael's cell as a way to tease him or some shit? Again, it's entirely unnecessary, and the very explicit scene goes on for way too fucking long as both men take turns with the inmate. It's honestly upsetting for me to even talk about it, and that's why I'm not going to show any of the explicit footage in this video. Michael only reacts after the men fuck with his masks, and he mercifully ends the scene by attacking Kendall and killing him in a real lame way, pretty much just choking him and tossing him aside. Noel tries to get away, but with his pants down around his ankles, he's unable to get very far, and Michael kills him in turn by smashing his head against the wall. That kill gives way to the Michael head tilt that's in the theatrical version, and then we segue into the stuff with Ismail arriving at the sanitarium. He eventually finds the bodies of those two nameless guards that, as I mentioned in the kill count, are separate victims from the four he killed in the theatrical escape sequence. That means we've got a different number of kills between the cuts, since we never get to see Bill Mosley and co. die in this version. Okay, now that we're past that, we can get to some more positive changes that are in the director's Scott. Real quick, the DC has an extra line from Joe Grizzly that Ken Foray delivers with glee. What we got here is failure to communicate. But the other additional scenes that mean a lot more to me are all the ones with Lori's parents. There are significantly more lines of dialogue from Cynthia and Mason Strode in the director's cut, and that's just fantastic because they're such good parent characters, and Dee Wallace is amazing. Do you think you could glue Mr. Bones' arms on or something? Have a good day, baby. Yeah. Top on my priority list. Oh, also exclusive to the director's cut, Lori Strode finger fucks a bagel. Driver, mommy, you want a hammer? <gasps> Look at this, mom. <gasps> Lori! I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Some insignificant additions to the director's cut include Michael being a big weirdo after Lori drops off the key at the Myers house. Why are you sniffing that envelope, dog? As well as an extra scene at Smith's Grove between Loomis and the people trying to blame him for Michael's escape, including Dr. Coplinson, who's played by Clint Howard. Christ, you can barely tell he's breathing half the time. He's been like a comatose kitty for 15 years. Sorry some of your stuff got cut, Clint, but if it means having a movie that's less than two hours, so be it. Oh, also, while the theatrical cut lets us surmise through editing where Loomis thinks Michael is headed, you know damn well where he's going. <laughs> the director's cut has him spell it out, and also reprises Dr. Wynn's line from the original about how far away Haddonfield is. Haddonfield! Is miles away from here. There's a little bit of extra dialogue between Lori and her friends on their walk home from school, where they talk about how a teacher might be into Linda, and then after her friends leave, Lori's walk home by herself is a couple of shots longer, and includes some fun editing that shows Michael Myers is following her around in broad daylight. When Lori gets home, we get another extra scene with Dee Wallace trying to set up some Halloween decorations while Michael watches from afar. Again, I just can't sing enough praises for her performance as Lori's mom. I'm still upset about the whole bagel thing this morning, if you want to know the truth. She's so good. Also, there's yet another shot that shows how Michael is very comfortable with daytime stalking. After Loomis and Sid Haig find the dead animal on Judith Myers' grave, the DC has a weird title card saying Trick or Treat. I really don't know what the purpose of it is, or why Rob Zombie threw it in before an extra shot of Michael, but there you go. Whatever makes the runtime longer, right? I do like some of the extra character stuff that the DC adds back in, though. Like a few more lines between Lori and her parents as she waits for Annie to pick her up, and an extra bit of conversation between Lori and Tommy Doyle, who 
I just want to say again, had a great kid actor in the form of Skylar Gazzondo. You know, if you listened to me the first time, you wouldn't have made it twice. Yeah, Lori, bow to your nine-year-old master. I also enjoy the sassy performance of Jenny Gregg Stewart as Lindsay Wallace, who gets some additional dialogue in the director's cut in an extra scene featuring the kids. Ah, I am Queen Sheba. Okay, bow down and worship me. Go get your jacket. <laughs> Besides that, the only other changes, aside from a few extra lines of dialogue between Loomis and Sheriff Brackett about how evil Michael is, are pretty minor. But they do add up to make Loomis more sympathetic in the director's cut. First, there's an extra shot of him and Lori after the empty swimming pool showdown, where he drapes his jacket over her shoulders. That's pretty nice. Then there's some additional dialogue when he's blaming himself for Michael's failure, wherein he does an extra bit of begging for Lori's life. Michael, it's my fault. I failed you. Please let her go. Please. And finally, as Lori takes refuge inside the attic to hide from Michael, the director's cut sees Loomis using his last bit of strength to grab Michael's leg and try to slow him down in his pursuit, although it doesn't end up doing a whole lot. Sorry, Loomy, but you know what, man? A for effort. And after that, everything's pretty much the same, up to and including the end of the movie. Overall, how did these two cuts compare? Let's use that same fun editing trick to find out, because for this series, I'm not gonna force myself to come up with a new transition every time. Sorry. As far as runtime goes, the director's cut is about 11 minutes longer than the theatrical version, since it adds in a lot of scenes and dialogue, most of which I'd argue are unnecessary. Like I mentioned before, there's a kill count discrepancy here. In the theatrical version, you see four guards killed, while in the director's cut, you instead only see Nolan Kendall. That means the theatrical version actually shows two more kills than the director's cut. Again, however, there's no difference in the gore or violence for any of the kills that both cuts share. The director's cut has a more sympathetic Dr. Loomis and more D. Wallace overall, which I can appreciate, but I I think I'd still trade all that for the shorter runtime of the theatrical version. Two hours just feels like way too long for a slasher flick. And finally, the escape scene in the theatrical version is a thousand times better, giving more agency to Michael Myers and not including the horrendous rape scene. That thing really annihilated my enjoyment of the director's cut. In fact, based on that scene's inclusion alone, my final verdict is that the theatrical version is superior. If you can find it, watch that instead of the director's cut. You'll save yourself some time and not have to watch that awful, awful scene. Hope you enjoyed this comparison of the two different cuts of Rob Zombie's Halloween. His sequel, Halloween 2, also has two different versions, and the differences between them are even greater, so you can expect another cut comparison next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice, and you can consider these cuts compared. Thanks a lot for watching my second cut comparison video. I want to keep thanking patrons who have been with me for over a year. People like Carl Ruffer, Kayla Meserly, Lucky Loki, Dominic McCarthy, and Jamie Sorenzen. This cut comparison wasn't as crazy as The Curse of Michael Myers, and I don't know if any ever will be. Hope you're enjoying all this stuff I'm putting out in October. There's plenty more left before the month ends. Thanks everybody, be good people.